Are you looking younger, Mike? Me? He is. <laughs> looking at whoever old I am. I'm... <laughs> so, yes. Uh, uh, that's that's for other people to say, isn't it? But I'm, I certainly feel as young as I've ever been. So that's always uh, good. I think so. I think you're looking. I think I think he is. I think he is. Every time he comes, I I watch him because I want to see what he's applying. He's, he's my marker for what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I look at him and I'm thinking, huh, is it working? Hmm, why is he looking old? Is this it is supposed to be getting younger with all the immortality business and restoration and whatever else that's going on it doesn't say you get younger because you can't you get should. Younger because you are the age you are but the age you are does not have to lead to death or lack of energy or lack of anything else so i have more energy now than i had probably when i was in my 20s I'm able to manage energy because I generate the energy I need to do whatever I need to do. Um, so that that's ultimately where you look at physical age is not the same as age. You know, in terms of, OK, I may be 60, whatever, I'm 66 years old. But actually, what do I feel like and how am I living like? And that is the the measure of it. Because it doesn't say you won't get older because every day, of course, you're going to get older from a worldly perspective. But that doesn't have to lead to death and it doesn't have to bring aging to the cells within. So my cells can be functioning perfectly well. Um, and I think from that perspective, it's the mindset that you're living in, not necessarily how you view and look. Because um, there are people who are hundreds of years old operating um, in as desert fathers or ancient ones or whatever you want to call them, who may not look young, but they have the ability to be whatever they choose to be. Wow. But there is one person that is a, an ancient person who a um, friend of mine engaged in spirit and they were young. And then they engaged them again and they weren't young and he couldn't understand. Well, what are you? And he said, well, I'm whatever I choose to be. Wow. Sometimes people look to express wisdom by age or appearance. And sometimes people look to see youth by appearance. But actually, it's a mindset that you live by, not an appearance issue. And he, he said, I appear to those that want me to appear of a, of a particular age, then I can appear that way and I can appear a different way to others. And mm -hmm. so I do believe ultimately we get to choose how we appear when we live in the mindset and reality of immortality rather than it. we are being affected by it. No, we are in control of it we rule in our lives therefore immortality is a actual an expression of the state of being and consciousness we live in not necessarily the physical appearance because the physical appearance can change uh, one way or another and ultimately i believe when we are fully functioning in sonship we will choose how we look wow jesus actually appeared differently to different people after the resurrection when he appeared to mary he she didn't see him as jesus she thought he was a gardener well was that her appearance now people can say oh well she was crying and therefore she couldn't really see yeah she totally could see she just the people on the emmaus road that jesus joined they didn't see him as jesus although they know knew jesus so his appearance must have been different. And then his appearance changed so that they could see him uh, in a form that they would recognize. And when Jesus appeared to Thomas, you know, after having appeared to the disciples in the upper room, he appeared again to Thomas. 
what was the expectation that how would Thomas view him? Well, he allowed Thomas to see the wounds and everything else that he was carrying. I don't think that was the normal way he went around with wounds. But he appeared to Thomas so Thomas could see, yes, it is you. You know, and the Emmaus Road experience was changed when he revealed himself to them. So I do believe that we will get to choose our appearance based on our ability to live in that conscious reality. But for me, I don't have a problem with my appearance because I know how I feel and I know how I'm living. So I don't need to look 20 years of age because that would be quite weird for general people it, my family and everyone else if suddenly i looked 20 years of age they wouldn't actually recognize me and that would cause a problem to them wouldn't cause a problem to me either way but actually i don't need to appear as a 20 year old because i'm a 66 year old so i'm happy to have that appearance but actually the cells of my body are not dying because aging is not death jesus aged from a baby to when he was 30 odd years old. If he had not died, he would have carried on aging, but he wouldn't have died of natural causes. He gave himself to death to take on our death so he could be resurrected and bring us life. So a lot of everything is all about the mindset that we live in. And therefore, I live in a mindset of immortality. That is not about physical aging or not physical aging. You know, I I don't want to be alive 100 years of age if I'm not fully healthy and fully able to fulfill everything I'm called to do and all, all who I am. Because what's the point of being alive if you're not enjoying life and full of energy and life? But... And that's why a lot of people don't even consider immortality because they don't want to live, carry on the life they're living now. But actually the life that I have now, I am fully in joy and peace about. And therefore I'm quite happy to continue living in the state that I'm in. Um, but I do believe that we will learn to choose how to live in this life and not be subject to it which is the quality of life, not just the fact that it won't end. Because you can have immortal life and you could be 500 years old, but if you're actually in a bed and you can't move, then that quality of life is not there. So immor immortal life is the quality of immortality, not just the fact that you don't die. And I think that really is a key is what quality of life would you choose to have? And do you choose to have? And can you maintain that quality with all of the things around us which try to get us to embrace death? People embrace death from the beginning that they live because there is the expectation, well, one day you're going to die, so make the most of life while you've got it. But there's always the, well, you're going to die one day. And that's programmed into children. Therefore, they see aging leading to death rather than aging leading to wisdom and, and immaturity in sonship and the abilities to be able to function in sonship. So I believe we need to have a mindset of immortality, which is not linked to age, but quality of life of an eternal immortal perspective and that is having all of the abilities restored to us that were intended and that would be the ability to dwell in both spiritual and physical realms that would be having the ability to travel by thought all sorts of actual abilities the ability of of multi-dimensional reality so you're not limited by time and space and the physical realm, you can be in multiple realms. There's all sorts of qualities of eternal life. 
an immortal life, which I do believe are more important than the physical appearance that we might have. Because I can therefore operate whatever physical appearance, as long as I'm operating in the quality of that life. And I think that's how God intends us to be. So it's interesting that people have different views of immortality and how it works. And I think if you're thinking about immortality um, from the perspective of, well, I'm not going to die, then you have to be prepared not to die. So how are you going to live? Because forget death. Death's not the issue. Life is the issue. How are we going to live an abundance of life? Jesus promised that we would have abundant life. The enemy comes to rob, kill and destroy. But I promise you abundant life. So what is abundant life? How do we embrace abundant life? How are you going to live for the next hundred years? Are you going to carry on working and earning a living? A wage to continue funding yourself for the next hundred years? Are you going to be able to find a way to provide for yourself, which is supernatural or operating out of a different mindset? Because people, you have to think about those issues as well. Because if your pension pot doesn't last a hundred years, you know, which for some people, you know, who've got a guaranteed pension, you know, they're not expecting to pay that pension for another hundred years, are they? They're expecting maybe 10, 20 years, maybe when you reach retirement age. So what will happen if you ran out of pension money? What are you going to do then? OK, well, we've got the state pension. Well, that will provide something. But actually, we need to be preparing for immortality now by thinking about what I will need to be able to do to maintain the lifestyle that I choose to live in. Whether that is living in a different way, so I'm not subject to the grid and having to pay bills and everything else, um, or can I manifest things in a way by choosing the reality where finances manifest or gold manifests? Is the financial system going to be the same for the next hundred years? I doubt it very much because I think the financial system as it stands is based on nothing, has no assets behind it. Therefore, it's all ethereal electronic money. And if that collapsed, what would you do then? And I do believe God will give us insight into how to prepare for the future so that we live not controlled by the system of the world around us, but we're living a heavenly world life on earth. Jesus obviously was able to manifest food. And he was, but he ate after the resurrection. So, um, but there are people today who live without eating. Breatharians who believe they can live on breath. So there's all sorts of ways of thinking about these things that we which we do need to have a not just oh i don't know i don't thought about that i don't really know well no let's think about it now let's prepare now let's be ready now for everything we need to live and everything we need to do and all the changes that are going to take place both financially politically worldly as God restores things, the trust in the systems that people now are trusting in will come to an end. People will need to look for a different solution, which I believe will be heaven on earth, a manifestation of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But people's trust in the present day systems that they're now living in, and we also live in those systems. We have to find a way of transitioning from where we are now into living fully manifested kingdom lives on earth as it is in heaven so it's a lot to think about around the whole subject it's oh great i'm gonna not die okay but how are you gonna live because it the thing of not dying is not the issue we shouldn't even have that as a consideration the thing is how am i going to live abundant life what is that going to look like which is a question i think all of us should be thinking about and be ready to have a perspective that then can be turned into a choice of reality 
which a lot of people aren't thinking that way. Last week, yeah. I was away with a bunch of believers and we were talking about stuff like you do. And we were talking, well, we were talking about general things, judgment. And I was saying how we often have the wrong idea of judgment being like condemnatory. And I said, but God's judgment, if you're in Christ, is always like a positive thing for us. It's like not guilty because of the blood of Jesus. Mm. And went on to explain a bit about um, God's unconditional love towards us, etc. And then one guy said, he's not so sure about God's unconditional love. And he, he says, what about that scripture? And it's in Luke 12, 48. The servant that knows his master's will and doesn't get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. And I said, well, I don't know about that, but I believe God's good and he's not going to be beating anybody up. I mean, that sounds awful. So I yeah. just wonder if you have any insight on that, because I really don't understand it. I don't no. understand what that means. Well, we've got to understand that Jesus was talking to a group of people which isn't people today so when he was talking to those people they were jewish people under a judaistic religious system that jesus knew was coming to an end so he was talking covenantally not personally part of the problem is people read the words of jesus and they think well that must apply to me <gasps> oh no what happens if i'm not faithful or what happens if this and what happens? and they get into fear about it Jesus in Matthew, Mark and Luke was talking to the Jewish people and the people of the day that he was trying to get to follow out of the old covenant system into the new. So when it talks about there, what seems to be judgment is talking about the system. Wow. So those who may not be operating under the old covenant system, and that could be seen as the Gentiles or it could be seen as Jewish people who weren't following the law or, or fulfilling the law. And now that's everybody, actually. But there are those who were self-righteously believing they were keeping the whole law. Pharisees, Sadducees, all of those people. They thought they were keeping the law. Therefore, they were self-righteous. And Jesus said, well, I've not come to call the righteous. Those who think they're righteous and think they're living a life which is thing, they're not going to listen to me. They're going to keep following their old system. So the covenantal system was going to come to an end. And those who weren't following it or knew they couldn't follow it, were going to end up following a new covenant system in which they realize it's all by grace, not works. Those who maintained following that system were going to end up in Jerusalem with the destruction of Jerusalem, which was the symbol of the structure, the end of the temple, the end of the heavens and the earth, which is what they called the temple. And their whole thing became obsolete and faded away and ended. So that's really what it's talking about. It's not talking about individuals. So Jesus was talking to them about their whole way of life. And that was a law based way of life, which failed, which is why Jesus challenged their views. You've heard it said, you know, hate your enemies. Well, I say unto you, you've heard it said. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say unto you. So he was challenging their beliefs, which were based on a system of law. So that they would realize that that system had failed. They couldn't keep it because he also said, all you are weary and heavy laden. In other words, all you are burdened trying to keep all these 613 laws. Follow me. Come to me and find rest. So when you look at it from that perspective, you've got to see just because there are red letters of Jesus's words, not all Jesus's words were speaking to today. Most of them were actually speaking within the context of the Jewish people under a Jewish system, which was coming to an end. Yeah. That is the, the audience that were listening. That's the context to which he was speaking. In John's gospel, you get a very different view. Because John's gospel was Jesus talking to the disciples who were following him and who were not going to follow that system, but were going to follow who he was. So he described himself. I am, which was the name of God. I am that I am. But he then added different aspects to I am. 
I am the bread of life. Well, they would have had a perspective on the manna which came out of heaven or Passover, bread, and all of that thing. So there's a culturally significant statement about what was the bread that came down out of heaven. Me, eat my flesh, drink my blood, which was a oh, challenge to them, of course. But he also described himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door for the sheep. You know, he had these statements which described him being the one that would be the entrance into the father. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one can come to the father but through me. So he was opening up a whole different realm. And then he talked to them about a new commandment, which was a new goal. Hey, you don't have to follow the law. I'm giving you a whole different way of living. Here it is. Let me love you so you can love other people. Complete change of emphasis. Away from looking to tell them about you know, the warnings that were coming. Because he warned in Luke, he warned in Math, Mark and Matthew about the destruction of Jerusalem. Was come, and the signs that would follow that destruction or lead up to it. And what would happen that was the end of their world. Because it was the end of their world. Because their world was a religious system. And that was the end of their world. And what was the new covenant that was to come. And so Jesus gives them a completely different mindset. Abide in me. You know, I am, follow me. And he warned them the same warning, don't follow this system, follow me. But he then also told them that this new life was coming. I am in the Father and the Father's in me. And you will know that on the day that I come back from resurrection and bring you into that life. So it's not just people who know jesus who are free from judgment it is those who are the new mankind that jesus breathed life into and were resurrected out of the death in adam into the life that's in christ so the whole of humanity went into death with jesus on the cross and the whole of the humanity came out of death in resurrection life and are now born from above. The whole goal is Jesus revealing himself to that humanity so they would actually enter into the truth and reality of what he's already done. So there's yeah. completely different perspective to you're no longer under a law that means you have to follow 613 rules because you never could anyway, because it was never my intention that you would follow rules. Yeah, but now you can follow me and I'm yeah, going to lead like you into the life of the Father. It's like that in the Psalms too, isn't it? Because um, they're writing things like, oh, break the teeth of the wicked. And Jesus says, no, he says, love your enemies and bless yeah. those who curse you, etc." So there's loads of that two thing going on, isn't there? Well, yeah, because they mm. had a completely wrong view of God and judgment. Mm. You know, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But Israel were called to be the light of the world, to demonstrate what it was to have a relationship with God. But they didn't want a relationship with God. They wanted a relationship with a law based system that would fulfill their thing of, well, we are the people of God and no one else is. But they were supposed to be saying we are the people of God so everyone else can be. But they missed the point. So Jesus comes and says, well, I am the light of the world. So everything that Israel should have been and weren't, he was and came to fulfill all of the law and the prophets in himself. And every promise of God and all the covenants that, that God had made were now fulfilled in him. So he is the true Israel, if you like, who was the light of the world. And then those that followed him, he also said, now you are the light of the world. So now you are the light that's going to draw people 
to the truth and see the light of that truth and find me. And so God was already at work in all people to reveal himself. So Paul um, was a Pharisee, was a follower of the law and was persecuting Christians. And Jesus was looking to reveal his true identity and true heavenly mission and vision. And so on the Damascus Road, Paul describes this encounter he had with God. And he says in, in Galatians 1.16 that the father was pleased to reveal his son in me. Not in the light or in the world, but in me. And then he's now given me this mission to preach Christ in the Gentiles, in yeah. everybody, included in what God had done. For Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, not the sin of Israel, but the whole world to take away their lost identity and to reveal the truth of their true identity as sons of God so they could follow him. And find relationship with him, free from religion. But it was a real difficult time for them because there was all of this people trying to get them back under the law and get them back under this system. You got to follow Moses. You know, and Paul's like, OK, here's the truth. Everything that I was, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, all of this stuff that I could have held as here's my righteousness. Is basically dung. It measures nothing. You know, it has no value and worth at all. And that is what he wanted to show. That everything is by this gospel of grace, which is you are included in what Jesus did. You just have to come to a realization of it so you can fully embrace and experience it. Which sadly, many people yeah. don't do because yeah. they're caught up in the religion system. Mm -hmm. Or not wanting that religious system. So they reject God on the basis of the religions that are supposed to be presenting God to them. Yeah. Or they're How following a religious system <laughs> and caught up in the same bondage that they were before. People seem very resistant to the love of God and him not being judgmental and him not wanting to beat people. It's like they, they think they just keep going on about, but there's got to be some punishment or chastisement or beating i'm thinking no because yeah. because they've created mm. a god in their own image mm. based on their own guilt shame and condemnation yeah so sad it is sad and if you think of it even logically god is love and that love has to be unconditional yeah if it wasn't unconditional it would have conditions attached to it Therefore, it would be earning something by fulfilling those conditions, whether it be conditions of repentance, faith, believing in God or whatever, those type of conditions, or whether it be like keeping a law or keeping a system or following a particular religious thing, whatever the systems are. If love is not unconditional, then there must be conditions to follow and therefore it can't be love. You don't love someone because they're good enough. You don't love your children because they're a grade students or something. And they you love them because they're your children. Yeah. God loves all his children unconditionally. Therefore, no conditions. Now, Christians would put conditions on that. Well, you've got to believe for him to love you. It doesn't say that anywhere. Anywhere. But it's conditioned that that is the truth. Other religions would have different things. You'd have to follow these things. If you're a Muslim, you've got to do a thing to Mecca or you've got to pray three times a day or whatever it is. And all of the stuff that are part of that. So every system of religion has a set of conditions that you have to follow. Jesus actually said there are no conditions. Basically, let me love you and you'll experience love and give love. That's really all he wanted us to do. And then Paul 
reiterated that by talking about grace and talking about mercy and talking about love and inclusion, not based on works. Because all of the religious systems are coming from the path of following the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, trying to be like God using our own effort, failing, feeling guilty and condemned and shamed, and therefore coming up with a system that would make us feel not guilty because we've done something that receives a reward that we're forgiven. So forgiveness becomes part of a reward system. You can only be forgiven if you ask for it. Well, no, Jesus forgave everyone on the cross. Yes, Every accusation forgiven. against yes. everyone was dealt with on the cross. <laughs> Jesus reconciled the world to himself. Well, that word world is cosmos, not counting their trespasses against them. So if Jesus doesn't count the trespasses against them, there aren't any to count against anybody. Therefore, there's no condition. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's the good news. It's, it's not easily accepted. I'll tell you what you know. No, I know it's accepted. No, oh, it's God. definitely not accepted. Um, <laughs> but unconditional love has to be that way. Otherwise, it's there are conditions attached, which means you've got to fulfill the conditions. Therefore, you've got to work for it. Yeah. And if then you don't fulfill the conditions, then you're not going to receive it. So people are afraid if they don't keep up the external facade of keeping the conditions, then they won't be accepted and loved by God and they won't, they'll lose their salvation. Definitely. Well, they never gained their salvation in the first place. They were saved from the results of lost identity by Jesus to enter into the abundance of life that he desires to give everyone. And yeah. that is simply what it is. But as soon as you start talking about unconditional love to evangelicals, they'll immediately come up with a whole list of buts. God is, yeah, God is love. Yes, the Bible says that. But he's also holy. As if, oh, that makes him two people? Or a God that has two faces. Holiness and love are the same thing. God is who he is. And therefore his holiness is expressed in love. Well, God is love. Yeah, but he's also just. Yes, he's just. So he's also dealt with by justifying us. Making it as if we never ever were lost which is a legal term. You have been justified. Therefore, you are not guilty. He's also made us righteous. So did we make ourselves righteous? No, he made us the righteousness of God in Christ. So we're included in God's righteousness. We don't have to try and be righteous. We just need to express the fact that we are righteous and live out of our righteousness rather than out of our unbelief and doubt and fear and all the other negative things that we we'll have if we don't know who we are. Yeah. So many Christians don't really know who they are. You know, so there's so many buts I've heard people say that is almost like they just can't believe how good God is. So they have to come up with a whole load of things that make it difficult to believe he's that good because well he's a judge yes he is a judge and he's judged everyone innocent so there you go god's love brings the judgment of innocent god has forgiven everybody holds nothing against anybody you know and if you look at all of that it really expresses who god really is mm -hmm. but if you look at the whole religious doctrines that we've been indoctrinated with then you'll come up with a different God, a God made out of theology and doctrine or whatever religion creates that version of God. And Christians have created their own version of God that says God needs to be appeased because of our sin. And then people say, well, what does that mean? Well, I have to repent and ask for forgiveness. 
or I can't be forgiven. And where does it say that? It doesn't say that, actually. God has forgiven everybody on the basis of what Jesus did, not holding anything against anybody. Simple, but difficult to believe if you think you have to fulfill some duties, obligations, or works to earn that love and forgiveness. Well, God can't accept me if I'm like I am. Well, he accepts you like you are. He just loves you too much to let you stay like you are. He wants to free you from like you are so you can be fully who he made you to be. Not stuck. You know, but most religious people get stuck because they come to the end, really realizing, well, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough. You know, because I keep failing and then I feel guilty and then I feel condemned and, oh, well, you know, God condemns me and therefore I don't feel loved anymore because, well, God's condemning me and all of that. Yeah. Mm. Sadly, a lot of people live in that mindset and belief yeah. system stuck there. There's not and a lot you can enjoying do. life. <laughs> mm. Mm -hmm. Jesus wanted us to have his joy in us so our joy could be full. He gave us his peace so we can be at peace, not striving for everything. And he loved us so that we can love an, one another and rest from our labors of trying to be good enough or perform to a standard that none of us could meet anyway. So Jesus took the standard away and said, I'm the standard. And now you're all in me. Hallelujah. So we did. <laughs> we didn't make a covenant with God that we can break. Jesus made the covenant with God and has included us in it. So there's nothing we can do to break that covenant. Yeah, because it's a covenant that's based in love, not a covenant that's based in judgment. <laughs> yeah, Mike, you were talking about um, your energy levels and how you activate your energy gates, sort of, speak, if that's the right word. Yeah. Have you done anything or any activation for this? Or can you show us how you do this to activate your energy levels on a daily? Do you do that on a daily basis or when, as and when you need it? I did it on a daily basis mm -hmm. to, start with, to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't do it now on a daily basis because I live in that state of being. Right. But we have it's all about the source that you're drawing from if you're drinking from a source that will never run out and never run dry and always has enough then you're always going to have enough if you're trying to come from a source that is not that source then you're going to run out so it's all about i'm drinking from the living water that god has placed within me as a fountain he says which bubbles up to eternal life and rivers of living water which flowing from my innermost being so i drink from a source which is flowing that in me becomes the energy that then enables me to live in abundance so that my innermost being is where the union of my spirit soul and body are and within that core of my being the rivers flow from my innermost being so they come into my innermost being because i drink from the source and the source is flowing in me then they within that then flow from me as rivers that are energizing me with life okay so the river what well, a river that has a dam on it and a hydroelectric power source generates electricity through a turbine That's that right. by the power of the water mm -hmm. so think about it the core of my being receives a flow of life from god that drives a turbine that then flows out as energy to my energy gates oh. and i did practice that by consciously choosing to drink from the right source seeing that flow within me to the core of my being that then generated all the energy that went to my energy gates 
whenever I needed it. And so, so yeah. activations to that did some in the unconditional love series. I also did it when I was talking about the Merkaba and energy yeah. gates which I've done as teaching sessions. Okay. But it's okay. just using to drink from the right source. Okay. And then seeing that source create the energy that I then can use within my whole being, whether it be the seven energy gates are the three main gates which govern the foundation of my life are the crown the heart and the the root that connects me to god that connects me to creation it connects me to the emotions that the experience of life um within there then there are other energy gates which are about creativity about how to see spiritually how to speak um, as an oracle all those part, are part of the seven energy gate system that god created for us to live by is that the tree of life then it is like the tree of life yeah you're drawing from the source and the tree of life balances heaven and earth spirit and soul within the body so it's like we don't want to be just engaging spiritually and heavenly we have to also engage physically within the soul and therefore we need all of these working together in union and therefore there's a balance between spirit and soul not one dominating so that is this harmony and peace okay so is this now um why um we are not experiencing abundant life and immortality because we don't know how to work this energy system why most of us are dying or are in uh yeah well i would say that in death decay and you know, hmm. destruction really so is that why yeah because you're drawing from the wrong source <laughs> basically jesus basically said whoever drinks of this water within them there will be a fountain that bubbles up to eternal life right becomes the source which is not external it's it is from heaven it's from the river of life which the tree of it flows through the tree of life which ultimately comes from the throne of god but it flows into our spirit most people get a trickle of that because they've never opened their gateways for it to flow so they only have a trickle which is described in you know ezekiel as the temple yeah, ezekiel, yeah. but it also says that this can go ankle deep knee yes, deep, knee deep. deep. But it's yes. Flowing, and it describes into the deserts it, it brings life wherever it goes which yeah. is what we need to do we need to see it flowing not just tr trickling but flowing therefore we need to choose that to be our source and to choose to open our life for that source to flow into us and if you're living yeah. on your own source you're going to run out eventually yeah because your own source is not the tree of life it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil yeah yeah Which so that so that explains then that we have not really dwelt on what ezekiel was talking about we are just thinking that he's talking about an external thing where this water or this river is flowing and making or restoring planet earth yeah. to its original intent in fact it's talking about us from our internal being for it then to affect the out the external it starts from us doing this yeah harnessing the energy from within so that we can then affect the external as it overflows from us uh, all right thank you because we are you that. Oh, thank you very much and the temple flows yeah. with of the spirit because jesus said in john 7 whoever drinks the this water will have rivers of living water this is of the spirit that you have not yet received because i've not yet been glorified 
So the uh -huh. spirit was not poured out or breathed into mankind until Jesus uh -huh. glorified and came back on the day of resurrection to the disciples in the That's upper right. room and breathed right. on and received the spirit. That's right. They were the first fruits of the new one new man in Christ. And that was just as God breathed into Adam and that life went to all of mankind. So Jesus breathed into his disciples and that was representative of all mankind. Um, but people right. were drinking from their own source. All right. Not flowing, the second like... question. Okay. The second question was or is, have you experienced the desert fathers yourself? Personally, no, but I have. <laughs> I've spoken to some people who have. So they have met them right. physically and sometimes in the spirit. Because these, yeah. these guys have learned to transcend. You know, they've learned to be able to live in heaven on earth in the spirit realm, because that's what maturity brings. Able to mm. have capacities of life. You know. But they're, they're, uh, not there to, they're not there to be a focus of attention. So they're there to fulfill a role of bringing God's kingdom and governing and legislating on earth as it is in heaven. So they're not there to draw attention to themselves. They're looking at, always to see God get the glory from their lives. So you have stories of the um Maharishi of Kalesh in which uh, a guy met this um, guy up in a Nepal cave and wrote a book about it of him and he was you know, hundreds of years old um so there are those who have written about it some I've talked to who said they've met them I personally haven't met them I don't really need to meet them to prove anything if you like because I believe it already yeah, so it's not like they're going to do anything. Some people say that John, the apostle, never died and is still living on earth, but also can dwell in heaven. And there was a prophecy from a guy, I think, from Morningstar, who said he had a vision or dream of John living in a cave. And John told him that he will actually be coming back onto the world scene. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I certainly have no issue with God um, and John not dying because they couldn't kill him. They tried to kill him several times, um, but he, he was not going to die because I think he knew what life was. You know, and life was not what people thought it was. He was close to the source and knew the truth of life. You know, from that perspective. All right, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that I heard as well about John from, I think is that Indian preacher Sadhu. Maybe. Yeah, that's, I think I heard it from there. Another yeah, pe number of people are, are reporting the similar sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't have any issue with that. Um. Um, but people would say, well, why isn't John out there talking about it to everyone? And Because that's our job. We are those that carry the light under the light of the world and carry the good news. If we indeed do carry good news. You know, a lot of what the good news has been has not been very good news at all. So we have to have a true message to be light. The true message is one of God's inclusion and love, grace and mercy in which the finished work of Jesus has accomplished everything for us. We just have to embrace what's already been done. That is good news. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.